This is the very first living room session of 2024. 2024! Your content is still shitty. That's why you're not growing. <laughs> if I make too much money, he will leave. He looked at me and he just kind of went, oh, that's so cute. <laughs> What would I have to do in order to 10X my business? I wouldn't be doing any of the same things. She absolutely could have all over me. My next book. And shared things. <laughs> I don't care if they don't like me, but I have to be me. We put our hands in, we're yeah. like, ready? And go! I want this big life, and it's also the thing I'm most afraid of. I roll in money with honey <laughs> on. I'm just kidding. This is a year of, like, let's go. Yeah. Yes. kick it off with questions. Who wants to go first? Okay, I saw Monique's hand first. You're on. Oh, you're, you're I'm on. <laughs> okay. You know I know, it's, it's, it's my first time. Because like, you feel myself. like it should be amplified like a normal microphone. Yeah, but. that's how I feel. I keep getting closer thinking it's going to get louder and it doesn't. My name is Monique Gomez. I'm a certified trauma and resilience life coach, massage therapist, and Reiki master. My business is called Golden Hands Massage, LLC. Oh, and so my good. handle is Moni Gomez underscore the coach. My question is. Can you massage us right now? Yes. <laughs> Actually, my office is just a rock away. So you can just walk on over. I love this. Okay. My question is, what was the very first old belief that you transformed or threw out that really amplified success, standing in her power, right? Ooh, I love that question. Mm -hmm. Okay, I have one immediately that came go to mind. It. Do you want me to go first? Okay, so a, what I notice for myself is that there's usually one belief that really has its roots. And even when I overcome it on one level, it'll change outfits and come back. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, you again. <laughs> and then I picture that scene in Bridesmaids where she's like in first class with sunglasses trying to pretend that she's it's not her. So the one, the one for it's... It's not, no, it's not me. It's not stove. The one, Wait. the one that for me has been persistent, even there's new versions of it now that show up, but I had a really, really big shedding process with it was this, the fundamental belief is that my success will make someone else feel uncomfortable. Mm. And I will project that fear onto anybody that I love. Mm. And there was this really pivotal moment with Elliot who is my husband, if you guys don't know. And, and it was at this point where I was starting to have really rapid growth, almost like my previous identity was like, and we need to go ahead and like get, hit the big red button, like really go for the throat mm -hmm. because my relationship is the one thing, like don't fuck with that. Mm -hmm. Like that is like the one thing in my life that is rock solid and it's like my foundation. And the moment I started, I, ha I remember I had our first ever six figure launch so in one launch, had earned over $100,000. And it was not very long after that that I woke up one morning and I was like, if I make too much money, he will leave. Mm. Now, I knew logically that thought wasn't true. I knew enough to know that it was coming from somewhere, like an upper limit. It wasn't true. It was coming from the part of me that was like, ooh, this is now you're becoming successful and this is what you've been afraid of and you better be careful. So instead of projecting that onto people that I didn't really care about, my brain went to the relationship I care most about. Now, because I knew that that what was happening and I'd read The Big Leap and I'd done a lot of that work didn't mean that logically knowing it wasn't true freed me from it. It took a little bit of time, but eventually a conversation with him where I just, cause I was afraid to say it to him cause I didn't want him to think that he did something to cause that. And it started with a conversation with him to say like, I am, I want you to know first and foremost, you didn't do anything to cause this. I'm just bumping up against like, I feel it. My body feels physically unsafe that I earned this much money. You obviously, through the work you do, know exactly what was going on. But it took a little while to, and a couple of conversations with him. Eventually, he in that first conversation, he looked at me and he just kind of went, oh, that's so cute. <laughs> and then he goes, he goes, do you know what I used to tell my friends when I was in high school? And I said, no, we did not know each other in high school. He said, I used to tell my friends, I'm going to marry a model who's a millionaire. 
And one of the things that happened at this, like in that season where it was a lot of growth is I was on the cover of So Scottsdale, which was like, felt like a big deal to me at the time. And he goes, I know you were just on a magazine cover, but you're technically not a millionaire yet. So you're not even coming close to like emasculating me or like, you're good. But it was, so I think what helped me was having conversations around it and then you know working with professionals like you who could help me even just like with somatic practices and figuring out like why those beliefs because sometimes we can know logically that a belief is limiting us but it was rooted so deeply in like my physiology that it, it took a little while to undo but on the other side of that was I remember like once I kind of got clear around that, it was a really expansive period. Like there are those cool times where if you do the work, if you're not afraid to look at the shadow parts and you really unlock it, that it unleashes like a whole quantum leap on the other side, which definitely happened. But it, it was a really uncomfortable couple. I don't remember the time frame, like couple of months, maybe maybe it was weeks, but it felt like months where I was really sitting with like this almost shame feeling like I was projecting that onto the person that I loved the most. But then also like this duality of like, I want this big life and it's also the thing that I'm most afraid of. Mm. So that's mine. <laughs> <laughs> so good. Anyway. I love that story about Elliot. Love yeah, that. that's, one that's, of my that's like the most Elliot story totally ever. Totally is. He's like, oh honey, no, no, no. You're gonna need to make a lot more money He's than like, that. Uh, you're gonna... <laughs> It's cute that you He's thought like, you I'm were... waiting and I'd like it this year. Thank <laughs> you so much. <laughs> so I want Daddy wants a new truck. I want that catamaran. It's the catamaran for it was Elliot. The catamaran. Yeah, he wants yes. a catamaran. Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, great question. Mine is you're not smart enough, and it just keeps changing outfits. She looks fancy. Sometimes she wears pleather. Sometimes she wears designer clothes. Does she ride a motorcycle? But she hasn't yet, but she might in my dreams tonight. So. Um, I did not graduate high school. So that like can, it, while I feel actually over that now, like very far over it, the idea of not being smart enough though, in everything I do, like even with this new company, I have so many days where I have great days, which we all do, right? We have great days where we're like, I'm amazing. Oh my God, I'm so good with this. You just intuitively know you're so good at something. You're like, this is something unique. Sometimes we don't know how to show it or harness it though. That's kind of the challenge. Um, but it's the, I'm not smart enough. Like, what was I thinking? I, you know, I take this 10 X leap this last couple of years and I'm like, oh my God, did I do something that was like, was I being naive? Am I someone who can't actually do this? Did I take the leap without having the skill set or the knowledge? Or am I going to be able to like hold everything that this vision has to take? And so that's constantly there. That does not go away, especially if you take a big leap. Are you kidding? All your stuff is going to come out all over again and even bigger. And so that's why you need more support than you've ever had. That's why when people say they do things alone, I'm like, they're, you're either a complete psycho, like you actually- Maybe like a sociopath. Block, yeah, sociopath. Um, or you're not telling us something about your team or your support system or your family. And typically what I've found with those people who feel really good, it's like digging in, in with podcasts when people are like, no, I felt really good through all of it. Like, yeah, I had my, you know, I had some doubts, but nothing crazy. Those people tend to have like very solid families and relationships. And so when I've asked them, you know, what would happen if you lost everything or you fail, they don't totally mind. Like there's not so much risk because their relationships are so solid. And that's what I found in kind of making up for that fear is having really incredible female friendships, really incredible entrepreneurial friendships, really incredible um, relationships with my family an incredible um, husband who we pour so much into our relationship that it seems counterintuitive, like you almost want to have a lot on the line, because you do, you do, you simultaneously want a lot on the line, but you also have to know that if everything blew up, if everything went to shit, that you still have to know that you're accepted in a few places in your life fully, no matter what. And I believe that that is what's gonna allow you to take all those risks and like break these patterns of beliefs, like even though it's gonna come back, it's knowing that no matter how much that belief comes back, because it's it's back there. Like it's it's what I grew up with. It's in there. It's it's an identity that I will forever continue to keep trying to uproot. 
Um, but the more that I make my relationship solid, the more I notice it just does not, it doesn't stop me. I still do exactly the same thing. I just keep moving forward. It's a great question. Who's got the next question? I'm like, you, you, I always make you pick. She's the bad guy. Okay. We'll go right here. Amy in the front with the sparkly pants (laughs) in case anyone listening is wondering what her outfit looks like. It's amazing by the way. My name's Amy Bartko. My company is called Chatterbox PR and Influencer Marketing. My Instagram is Chatterbox PR and Marketing. My question is, what self-care practices did you implement that helped you grow your business? Great question. Mm. Self-care. So ours might be quite similar. Things like movement, Things like, for me, meditation, but it's looked all different forms. Mm -hmm. I was just sharing uh, with my fellow Dr. Joe Dispenza lover over there that, you know, I had a season where I was doing more like guided meditations. Right now I'm challenging myself to sit in silent meditation and just like hear more of my own intuition and guidance. And I feel like, I feel like the more I do that, if I create time for quiet, but for me, that's really like creative thinking time. It always feels like the last thing I have time for, and it's always the most valuable thing for me to do. And then even like a combination of that with some type of movement, whether it's walking, going to the gym, I I get a lot of ideas when I'm moving my body. I've learned that in the last couple of years that my ideas don't come when I'm sitting behind my computer saying, be creative. (laughs) Almost every podcast I've ever done has been outlined during a workout, walking on the treadmill, walking outside. So I think it's just been the biggest self-care for me has has been just learning how I'm wired and looking at how I can set my day up to support more of that. And I realize I need a lot of quiet time, a lot of alone time, a lot meaning, you know, little pockets throughout the day where I can get it. Even if I'm alone by myself at a coffee shop, but there's other people around and like the ambient noise time I can be with my own thoughts. And then I'm just a better and happier person when I move. Mm. Oh my gosh. There's been so many through the years because you guys know, like five years ago, your self-care looked different and it, it changes all the time. So I think, um, one that I want to share that, that, seems like not self-care, but it, it is, but just like boundaries and even not answering certain, allowing it to be okay for my inbox to be overflowing right now. Like my email is pretty much overflowing and my inbox on social media is overflowing. I'm like, it's okay to not answer everything. Like that's just huge. because other people want something from you. I don't base who I am if I don't answer it. Like before it was, they're going to think I'm a flake. No, I just cannot, absolutely cannot get to it and be the woman that I want to be to the people that I want to be that to if I'm answering everything. So are you kidding? I'd love to go on everyone's podcast here, but I absolutely neglect all my relationships if I were to do that. And it also interrupts my flow because I'm someone who now knows thyself and I need a lot more time than I thought I did to understand what it looks like to like what what on earth would our mastery look like? Like each individual person's mastery in here. And again, I was listening to the the book. We'll just call it the book. (laughs) 10X is easier than 2X this morning. And they were using a funny story of a man that was a true story. It was way back in the day though, when he would get a lot of, he was like, someone who was famous, I believe, I'm gonna slaughter this, but he would get a lot of requests from people who wanted something from him. And he had written someone back and he didn't even normally write people back. And he said, I've purchased a large trash basket next to my desk, like in all honesty, for requests like this, because I believe that I have been divinely blessed with this calling. And if I do what you want me to do, I will be ignoring my calling and turning away from his beliefs. And I was like, oh my gosh, if we really all understood what we have been gifted with and what we are here to do, we wouldn't be saying yes to everyone or worrying about getting back to people or worrying if people don't like us. Because if someone doesn't like you for not getting back to them for something, I'm not talking about flaking. I'm very, very, very like, I. if I say yes to you, we're going to finish that. It's going to be complete and we're going to do it in a timely manner to the best of my ability. But if it's a demand out of nowhere, Absolutely not. I will not like lean into that. And that has been one of the biggest self-care things. And in all honesty, like Lindsay knows now, especially even around, even 
Implementing them around social things and events has been huge for me. There was a period of time for a couple of years before this where I wouldn't even, I didn't even want to get in rooms or events anymore because I had no boundaries. I'd be, I'd stay for two hours after, after an event, talking to people, taking pictures, making sure every single person knew that I wanted to meet them and that they were happy. And now I'm like, no, I, if I'm going to do this on a regular basis and be in a room with you, I got to be out in 20 minutes. Like I want to go see my husband. I have another day just like this tomorrow. And so I think for all of you, I hope that that gives you permission because it wasn't until I saw women doing it. In fact, I have like many mentors around it. Gabby Bernstein, Jenna Kutcher are two of my biggest boundary mentors. And I will be totally honest, like I have experienced their boundaries and it offended me at first. I was like, oh, ouch. I can't believe that you would say no to all of these asks over and over like I've done these things for you. They didn't ask me to do those things. Just because you're doing something for someone does not mean they energetically owe you anything. And that is one of the most powerful things because as you guys grow, you will start to have that on the inverse. Just because someone does something because eventually in the back of their mind, they're hoping you do something does not mean you have to do something, especially if it takes you away from a higher call. So just knowing that like not saying yes doesn't make you mean, it makes you very committed to your goal and your calling. And that is what will inspire women to finally get some boundaries, to be happy, to not have resentment. And for all of us just to let it be okay to flow in, out, in and out of the places where we're meant to be. Mm -hmm. 100%, like if it comes to self-care to grow your business. That's been the biggest self-care for no me. Saying no is absolutely self-care. Mm -hmm. Love yes <gasps> so <Next>. hot <laughs> okay next We're question thank you for that mm -hmm. yes great well, question yeah. i'm alicia citro i'm a habits coach and i can now officially say this i am an author of <gasps> higher self habits Yay! which will be published this spring and my name's too hard to spell so i won't give you my instagram okay so my question is uh 10xing how do you prepare your nervous system for that so that it can hold. That keeps coming up, but I want specifics and I don't believe in TMI, so as much as you wanna share. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I feel like I'm, I'm learning a lot about this myself right now. So I can share what I'm learning and then I'll be sharing a lot more about it as I have the experience. So for sure, I realized that a big piece of it for me is I'm in this phase right now of getting very curious about my triggers in the moment that they're happening in a whole different way than I ever have just like welcomed in where I'm getting super triggered or where fears are showing up. A part of that has been allowing the space to process through big emotions as they're happening. Because what you're asking is like, how do you prepare your nervous system to hold the next level of success? Usually there's things that we have to let go in order to clear that space. I've shared on a few different pod podcast, the one we did about the seasons was one. And what I didn't expect was as I was clearing space, I was getting that intuition. So the first piece is I've just like really deepened my intuition, listening to like, okay, where do I feel like it's saying to slow down, even though I don't like going slow. And what I didn't expect was that with the space I created, a lot of big emotions came up, things that I, I'm not like an angry person. And I experienced like actual rage for like a short period of time, there was like days where it would bubble up. And instead of like being like, no, I can't, I can't feel that right now. I don't have time yelling into a pillow, like having those like releases, like allowing myself to like ugly cry it out and then sitting with like, okay, what was that about? And where, where was, and a lot of it for me has come back to, then it shows me something about myself that mm. by resisting the emotion, I didn't have to deal with the root of it which a lot of it for me has come back to control. So it's showing me like what, what is in conflict with this new identity I want to embody. And a lot of it for me has been, you know, controlling the outcomes for myself, for other people, having a lot of expectations that I'm, people aren't meeting because I'm not even letting them know I have these expectations of them. <laughs> and so really tuning into my emotions creating enough time and space to feel them fully, which I've never really allowed myself the space to do. Even my Enneagram type, all of it is very like passive aggressive. And then I'll have these moments of it's just like Midwest. outbursts. It is the Midwest in me too, right? <laughs> and, or just being like, I don't have time to do this. I can compartmentalize pretty easily, but then the part, the compartment that I was piling like, okay, feel this later, deal with this later, 
just kept piling up. So actually letting myself release some of that. And it wasn't even big things. It really, it wasn't even anything that was like that earth shattering, which I think made me even more likely to just push it to the wayside. Cause it was like, yeah, okay. I know I'm kind of like pissed because of the X, Y, Z, or I feel this sense of like, I don't have control over my safety and security right now. We're taking some big risks. And instead of, I was just like, yeah, 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 I know that. But like my body was feeling it and I wasn't acknowledging that. So right now that's, that's what it has looked like working with mentors, therapists, like, you know, professionals to help with that process. Cause sometimes I'm not always good at mm-hmm. seeing it in myself. Those are two of the biggest ones that, and one of the biggest that I think is going to be even bigger for me this year is doing more things that bring me a lot of joy. Mm-hmm dance like moving my body I'm noticing is like a huge part of it too and one of the things I also happen to love is dance so making sure that no matter how busy my schedule gets I'm I'm creating time for that has felt really really supportive because it also then makes me notice where like I feel awkward if I like don't know the choreography so it's bringing up all these things that is are required for my next level self to operate at a place where there's just more freedom to be a beginner and look stupid and be seen as not having it all together in front of more people and then it's just like this loop right because then that brings up more feelings so that's been the process that just this last year for me mm, i love that um i don't think i've ever prepared I think it's more like, how do I go into, oh shit, my nervous system is on, oh, like freaking out. Uh, Cause I will, I, I feel like once I started learning about taking leaps and, and how it works for me, like I just have to like commit before I think about it. Like I have to commit when my, when I, when my soul feels excited, like when I'm like, oh, that's a hell yes. I, I want to lock it in, in that moment for me, because then I know what's coming on the other side, the tidal wave of everything that sucks. Um, so I don't <laughs> think I prepare my nervous system. I think I'm like, oh my God, I need help. That's typically how this works for me. Um, thankfully from my past, I've got a really good foundation of just, I think preparing your nervous system is a lot about or or supporting your nervous system is so much about health and supporting the vessel so remembering that um you know we saw each other at the gym so i got to get my workout in i'm just like have to move that's a really big piece because energetically you guys are taking on a lot of new energy and you're holding a lot so your capacity is like being tested so i do believe that your capacity and your strength does correlate with your physical strength I think it literally goes hand in hand. I've found that when I have really big things coming up that I need to hold, that I can tend to start lifting heavier or getting more focused on not even necessarily heavier, like really dialing in just doing the mundane and the challenging things for my body, knowing like making sure that I have the strength, eating well, drinking a lot of water, things like that. And that doesn't always happen, by the way, like I can have seasons where I'm in a really rough spot and it's I I notice that I need to support that more. As far as other things, really, my relationships have been so huge for my nervous system. A lot of the things that Lindsay said, but I'm a verbal processor, if you can't tell. Like, we, I could probably just four hours with nothing, no one else. <laughs> um, so I need to literally talk through what I'm going through and what I need. And I don't even know what I need sometimes until I go on a, a bestie fitness walk and I'm like, Oh my God. I like, I just need to vomit all of it to figure out what the actual thing is. And I typically even solve it while I'm by yourself. I don't even really, (laughs) I'm just the sounding board. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. Say more about that. Your level of "Mm," and "Mm," (laughs) is so compassionate that it makes me feel so safe that like 7,000 mms later, I'm like, we got this. (laughs) And she's like, you're so wise. But it's true. And I think that that also for me, as bigger fears and triggers have been showing up, realizing that I don't have to process through those alone. Mm -hmm. And where I I think my previous belief was that it made me feel like a burden to people Mm because the people I want to process with who can actually hold the space I need are also really busy people up to big things. Realizing that it's not a burden, it actually made me feel more supported. It made our friendship feel more connected, but really cultivating back to like why it's so important to cultivate those relationships and people who are like in the arena with you. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of times we're bouncing things off one another that the other has gone through already. And that remembering that I have those people and actually 
communicating with them when I'm not okay is the biggest lesson I've learned like in the last three months because mm-hmm. there was a lot I was holding not wanting to to burden other people with it mm. yeah. such a great, great question. question your outfit is fabulous too and she's super hot at the she's super hot at the gym too to learn. <laughs> oh, love those girls <laughs> okay next question yes we'll come right here in the front um, so my name is Charlene Byers, and I am a dating and relationship coach. And I really actually specifically help women, you know, clear their love blocks and find husbands. Okay, and tell people where to find you for yeah, our listeners. they're going to want to know. Um, so my handle on Instagram is M-S Charlene, C-H-A-R-L-E-N-E, Byers, B-Y-A-R-S. So I'm feeling a lot of emotion right now. Like this conversation is really affecting me in this, all these things are coming up. You guys talked a lot about um, earlier about your identity prior to where, how you have to keep changing identity. So I'm going to try to get to the question. What was the thing that really helped you take it? Because I feel, I've always felt that my identity as a woman has been helping people, you know, like I never ask for stuff myself. And, um, but I always love to help other people and have them get their dreams and their relationships and all that. And now I find that I'm, I'm in a season that I need to grow. And I'm really struggling with asking mm. for the help, for, you know, making new friendships, going to bigger levels, because I'm comfortable with where I'm at. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. Um, do you feel really deeply connected in some of your relationships? Do you feel supported? Um, some I do, some I don't. Okay. How about the ones where you want to go to the next level? Like, no. Okay, cool. Great. I think I know your question. So say it one more time. What was the biggest shift that you ladies made when you knew that you had to start asking, get uncomfortable, but your identity Mm. has always been that you are the one that helps people. Got it. Okay. Okay, I'm just running because I'm like, you're talking, you are me. Okay. (laughs) Um, So when I first moved to California, I remember I was making all of these new friends and I I felt like I had some friends that I felt very supported in. Like I had some great friends. I had some, you know, people who are still in my life right now, but not the friends who I knew were going to take me to the next level. They were my, they were my, still my people. Like they were solid they were amazing. They were my crash pad, but I didn't have my launch pad friends. And I noticed that around my launch pad friends, I wasn't being vulnerable. I wanted to help them. And if I couldn't help them, I didn't feel good. So I avoided them. And sometimes I didn't feel like I was good enough to help them. And I certainly wasn't being vulnerable enough to share what I needed or ask for help. So there is no connection when you do not share what you need. There is no connection I will say that again for all of you overachievers. There is zero connection for that other person when you don't share what you need, what you're struggling with, and where you're really at. And it wasn't until I had full-on fucking breakdowns around people and then felt such vulnerability hangover. Like you almost, in the beginning, I hope that I can keep you from doing too much because I was just like, there was so much there that, and I don't think you can do too much to be honest, because it's all on your path and it's all meant to happen. But I remember I'd be sitting at these tables and this still, this still can really hit me. I'll be at these tables with these women and, and I'll be wanting to help them so bad. And if I feel like I can't help with their problem, because sometimes they're next level problems that I don't know about, then I don't feel like I have value because my value was only if I could help you. I didn't understand that there's so much value and vulnerability. And so you're robbing people. Lindsay is one of the relationships that really locked that in even deeper for me of like, she can't be close to me unless I'm vulnerable to her where she could maybe also help or it doesn't even mean help. Here's the biggest breakthrough for me. Holding space and listening for someone and not giving any advice is sometimes the most valuable thing that you can give someone. And so when I stopped equating value to only helping people and understanding how valuable it was for me just to be honest and show up with like all of this stuff, because how many times have you been in a relationship where someone just like someone who is not just dumping on you, but someone who really shares where they're at, does it not give you the freedom to know that you're not alone? 
Does it not make you feel more normal? Does it not make you feel like, oh my God, we're all like this and it's just proving to me that we can all do it? So I think that this is a really common thing amongst women like us is that we get a lot of our value from being able to help people. And we, it's so easy for them to go, what we don't realize is sometimes I remember I was saying this in my relationships. I was like, yeah, I have all these women who feel like they're my best friend, but I don't feel like I'm their best friend back. And I realized it was because we'd go to dinner and they'd be like, so how are you? I'm like, I'm great. How are you? And I would never, ever share. And I remember going back to Chris and saying, he's like, how was your dinner? I know like you're trying to make better friends. And I was, I, I never felt like I fit anywhere. And he'd be like, how was your dinner? And so excited. And I'm like, great, but I should have charged him like $3,000 because it was a therapy <laughs> session. And I, I really like that much of an asshole. I sounded like, like all of the time because I did not realize they were asking me how I was. I kept going, oh, they're just, they're, they don't listen. We talk about them the whole time. All I do is pour into these people. It's a coaching session. They asked you how you were, but you weren't honest. Like you weren't, yeah. And I will say there are people that now I look back, I'm like, yeah, I don't, I didn't necessarily want to share where I was at with that, you know, with certain things because I wanted, I, I wanted somebody who maybe understood where I was at. So I think it's just, it's looking at are you being vulnerable? Do you have the relationships where you can be vulnerable? Are you willing to take that risk? Because people look at our relationships that we have in our life and even our relationship. This was not easy. There were a lot of big risks. There were text messages sent after hours of conversation with her where I'm like, I feel really vulnerable. I said things I shouldn't have said. I talked about people. I, I hope you never share that. Like so many things like that where there's a lot of trust and can can things happen in female relationships yeah. she absolutely could have shit all over me my next book. and shared things yeah. <laughs> i kid i kid i kid and that is a risk and that has happened to me yeah. two previous times in relationships but did it stop me from making more female friendships that now are like i'm so glad i never gave up so glad i never gave up we we share like the past couple relationships we've had, you know, prior to each other where it was like, oh, that just, that didn't go as planned, but it was such a good, <laughs> but you can't ever stop. Like you can't ever, ever quit trying to make these different relationships um, because they serve you. They are just the greatest things on the planet. So I know that that is in your near, near future. And I also know you have all the text messages to send about vulnerability hangovers and please don't share that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah um yeah you're welcome and I feel like I'm gonna take this a layer deeper because my lesson in all of that and where I realize I was subconsciously continuing to attract the friendships where I did feel like I was giving 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 because I wasn't comfortable receiving mm -hmm. and if you want to grow your business you mm -hmm. have to mm -hmm. yeah then that that's showing you that there's some beautiful work to do to discover what it means for you to learn to receive. And I'll share a couple of the things that I did like really practically to start practicing this because I started to pay attention. And again, this we could joke that like this is the Midwest in me. It's like if someone would give me a compliment, I would immediately like give them a compliment back. Wouldn't even take the time to just say like, wow, thank you. You, you asked if I ride a motorcycle because I'm wearing a leather jacket. That's so kind. That's what the flight attendant asked me on my flight. Um, noticing where I would deflect, where I didn't allow a compliment in. Noticing where if someone said, can I help you? Or sometimes they'd say, can I, can I hold that door for you? Mm -hmm. Can I grab that thing for you? I am the queen of, no, I got it. And I, and I do, like I've got it. But that was another small example of not allowing myself to receive help, to receive support. Or if someone would say, is there anything I can do to support you right now? A lot of times just in the moment, I'm kind of, especially if it's a DM or it's something, I'm like, oh, I can't really think of anything. So I started to take on this practice that was really, really powerful. And I did it with the intention to learn and see some of my blind spots where I wasn't comfortable receiving. So the first one was, noticing those compliments that I would step over and just like trying in, in whatever way felt authentic for me, just sitting with that compliment when someone would compliment an outfit or uh, say, oh, your podcast made such an impact, or maybe it's a client that sends you feedback, just sitting for a moment and like letting that in. 
And all I was allowed to say, bless you, was thank you. Even though everything in me wanted to be like, well, I love your hair too. Or the really Midwest thing would be if someone would compliment my outfit, I'd be like, thanks, I got it on sale. Mm -hmm. Or I would point out if it had a flaw, like, well, there's a hole right here. And the person's like, that's a really <laughs> odd thing for you to say. <laughs> which, which is, I mean, if you think about it though, that's a deflection. I didn't want to allow in the good feeling, receiving mm -hmm. that acknowledgement, receiving that love. And so, Anytime someone were to, sit, to say a compliment, I just said, thank you. The second thing, when someone said, can I help you with that? Can I support you? Or how can I help you? I had to say yes if they offered help. And I had to give an answer if they said, how can I help you? So simple as like, people will say this all the time, you know, what can I do to support you? You've given me so much, what can I do to support you? Instead of just saying like, oh no, nothing. I'll say, now I, I force myself to come up with something. Hey, it would mean a lot. If you love the podcast, have you left it a review? I know it's like so silly, but everybody listening, leaving us podcast reviews is a huge way to support your favorite shows. So what it did was it, it just allowed me to tap into this mode of receiving. And if we wanna receive more abundance, we want to receive more love. This is going to be so powerful with the women you impact because the moment you're on the other side of this transformation, you're going to start to see where your clients maybe aren't connecting with their dream partners because of their inability to receive. It also shows up in the bedroom. I'm just mm -hmm. going to let you know that too. Oh, yeah. It does. If, if we're going to be in, you said T, no TMI, right? Like the inability to receive absolutely blocks us from pleasure, from money, from everything that we want to experience. You look beautiful tonight. Look at that. Such a great student. <laughs> look at that she did it. Such a great student. Thank you for that beautiful question. Okay, we probably have time for one more. Okay, I heard your hand go up with such velocity. She's not whoosh. even in my line of sight, and I heard it. It was a whoosh. Okay. She said one more, and I was like, I'm the one. Yes. Um, uh, hello, my name is Kate, and I um, my company is Your Behind the Scenes BFF. Um, where I teach women how to build businesses and scale as virtual assistants. And then I also connect business owners with the VAs from our program. Um, and my handle is your BFF Kate. So my question is, what is your best advice for getting over the fear of success and like being seen? Mm. Mm. Do you got anything? <laughs> um, I roll in money with honey on. <laughs> Um, fear of success. I mean, fear of success isn't, you're not afraid of success. You're afraid of the eyeballs that come with it. Um, so, oh, what do you do for that? I don't know. Help me. I'm just I kidding. Know. Um, well, it's, I actually am doing an entire doing right episode now. on yeah. this. I'm going to, I'm going to come out with a whole episode on this. Cause I got really, I, it's actually something that I used to say as well. Here, here's where I'm prepping right now for the episode. So stay tuned for that whole episode on it. But here's the questions I'm asking myself, which I think are giving me some cool insights. Like Lori said, I don't think we're actually afraid of success. What do we believe success means? Mm. What do we believe it brings with it that we haven't experienced? And who do we believe we need to become that just feels really uncomfortable yeah. in order to have the success? Mm -hmm. For me, when I looked underneath the surface, a lot of times it was, I had this idea of the responsibility that it, that came with it. Some, there've been some seasons where that was the case, more people relying on me, which was me trying to envision myself in that next level of success as my current self. The one who didn't ask for help, couldn't receive. So yeah, that, would have, that actually would have been terrible. So what I realized I needed to do then was really work on being able to receive more, delegating more, asking for more help which you have a whole business revolved around that, right? And how so, it works at it. Well, there you go. And that's, that's such a beautiful insight. Like there's so much power there. So it, I don't believe it's that we're afraid of success. It's we're afraid of what someone else is going to think about it, how it's going to change dynamics between us and other people, or just how is it going to trigger our own identity? Mm -hmm. Because success does require, just like we've been talking about all night, a change in your identity. Mm -hmm. And there your brain wants no part of that the part of, it's true like the no, moment i started mm -hmm. to realize how my brain was working against me it helped me just have more compassion for mm -hmm. myself in the journey to realize that if like the same part of my brain that 
is right now regulating my heartbeat and my breathing, that any change in those two would equal death. Mm -hmm. So no wonder it starts to feel like death the moment I'm envisioning this quantum leap and becoming this new version, because it's just a big change. So looking underneath the fear of success, what about success are you really afraid of? And simple journaling exercises, like let's just even put an actual quantifiable result to what success feels like for you. So like that next quantum leap, maybe it's like 10 xing the income in your business and just writing out, okay, if I were to earn a million dollars in my business, I'm afraid that, mm -hmm. and just let yourself go. Don't filter what you write. You might find things come out and you're like, oh, I didn't realize that that was a fear. But I think just putting pen to paper has always been really powerful for me to then figure out where I need to dive a little bit more into whether it be like some of the work I've done with mentors or somatic work to realize what what's really there. Sometimes I get to the root of it and I realize like, oh, it's actually all made up. It, I'm actually mm -hmm. not not that afraid. And that has been powerful too. Mm -hmm. I love that you put that. I mean, you made it so clear on what to do. I think the other thing is, right, so do everything that she did. And then the other thing that I take just one step further, which you, you probably actually have this too, is just what am I afraid of and can I handle that if it happens? What will Ooh, I do yeah. if it happens? So I always, in everything that I've ever done, I say... If I do this, what is the worst case scenario? How do I survive it? And once I have my how do I survive it in place, I go forward. Like, okay, if you can survive it, like, okay, let's say we go viral and we stay viral. Like our content is just crushing it and all these comments are horrible. And then all of a sudden you get canceled, right? Can you handle it? Can you handle if you get canceled? Will you come back? Will you come back quickly? How? What's your plan? Who will you talk to? Who are you actually going to even talk to about this plan? Like, you better believe if my shit starts going viral, I'm going to be like, what's my plan if something happens? Like, I'll be in the comments just with all the positive comments. Like, what's going like, to wow, this Lindsay girl, really, <laughs> really supportive. And then also, how, how are you going to support it? But then even more important once you get to that point is who has been through that worst case scenario that you can implant evidence that they didn't die. Mm -hmm. They actually thrived on the other side. They built an even bigger business. So it's it's giving your mind the evidence for why that isn't actually a worst case scenario or even something to fear. Mm -hmm. If what fear really is, is it's a discomfort with the unknown. Mm -hmm. Success is the unknown. And then you're going to reach that level of unknown and you're going to see another level. So it never ends. But I feel like when I can do that, go to the worst case scenario, but then implant evidence for what I want and how people have thrived, even in the worst case scenario, you start to really support the way your mind is wired. Because if you have that vision for more success, that's, it's your destiny. You can't, mm -hmm. the longer we spend fighting it, that's less energy we have to be impacting the people we know we're meant to impact. And I just want to share on the on the success thing, like, I think all of us have this vision of being successful with everybody liking us and like kind of flying under the radar on a lot great. of things. <laughs> it's, that would be great. In order to be successful, like success actually comes because you're something that like stands for something, but also is very clear in who they are. So it's very much not something else. So if you actually go and look at all of the people who are very quote unquote successful or the people who are very popular on Instagram, go read their comments. They have just as many negative comments as positive comments. The negative comments and the positive comments together are what spikes something to get popular. It's the conversation. It's not necessarily just the ones that are like, go girl, you look amazing, whatever, all of these things, congratulations. It's because there's a contrast that's happening. And so I always think of that with my friend was just sharing with me about when her book came out and it was a New York Times uh, bestseller. And she was like, oh, my gosh, this is a lot at once. Pre talk about prepare your nervous system, right? Like from not having that to all of that attention all at once. And she said the thing that made her just really be able to like hold it all was going to all of her favorite books, the best books in all of history, like th that are at the top of everything. And she said the amount of negative comments on them were almost more than the positive comments, even though they've sold the most, they're the most cherished 
cherish, they're the most loved. And so it's the remembrance that yes, success will bring that, but how can you like not allow that in? So I don't read my reviews anymore. I just like will not even go to them. I can have my team look, let's make sure there's anything controlled that needs to be controlled. But like, how are you gonna handle those things coming in and knowing that success isn't gonna be everyone liking you. That's not actually how you become successful. I've had so many posts that I wanna put out that I'm like, I know that this will really hit, but I'm scared people won't like it. And so I won't put it out. And I'm still in that place, even though that's the stuff I wanna be putting out. But will I do it? We'll see. <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> I love that question and it's so relatable. I feel like that's what I hope people get from listening to both of our podcasts is hearing like the two real people who are in this journey with you who have not figured this out, but we are really grateful to not be doing it alone. Mm -hmm. It's just really fun to be a giant shit show with you. <laughs> Thanks for being in our, a part of our shit show, everybody. Yes. <laughs> oh. Oh, Yay. For